Here's a fun drinking game. Take a shot every time I say power or powerful or something related to power. Power. Some have it, others want it. Some say it corrupts, others say those people are stupid. Now get back to work before I fire you for a tax break, you worthless piece of- But what happens to a story when one of its characters is maybe too powerful? Well, if you're an isekai writer, nothing. Your guy could just steamroll anything in their path before adding it to their harem that they most definitely have. But today I want to talk about some examples of actually good writers who handle their potentially overpowered characters in interesting ways that stop them from breaking their respective stories entirely. Starting with the hopefully still topical Let's be gay I'm going to fuck you with my giant dick Now, the writing in Hasbun is not the best, but a character who I think it really pulls through for, and who people are very normal about, I swear, is Alistair, who among the main population of Hell is pretty fucking strong. Throughout most of the series, he's shown absolutely dunking on sinners and even other overlords with ease. And like, man does not care. He will kill your family and then afterwards call you short. So yeah, Alistair's kind of built up as the fix-it-all trump card of the main cast. That is until the finale of season one, where he fights Adam and loses, which almost results in everyone getting exterminated. The thing is, Alistair isn't actually that strong in the grand scheme of things, somehow being less powerful than this twink. It's worth remembering, a big part of what makes Alistair so scary is his reputation, his image. Sure, he's no slouch power-wise, but a lot of why he's so memorable both in the show and IRL is down to how he presents himself which serves him fine among his peers, but he's still only halfway up the food chain. And at the end of the day, the one person who could beat Adam was the King of Hell himself. But I think the way the show kind of conditioned the viewer into seeing Alistair as an all-powerful being only for him to lose, and for that expectation to be subverted, was a really cool way of showing that yeah, Adam is sort of fucking strong. Mind, if we're talking about that kind of subversion, I'd say it was probably better when they did it with you are my special. I'm only talking about the anime by the way, reading is for nerds. So Alistair was powerful, yeah, sure, but he had to build his rep up from scratch. And when it was up to him to fight a bigger fish, dude was more cooked than his mum's jambalaya. But would Gojo lose? Would he fuck? See, Gojo isn't just strong, he's the strongest. Period. Bo is so insanely powerful, his birth caused the balance of the whole Jujutsu world to change just to meet his level. Every time the narrator is hyping up a new character as hot shit, he's then required to specify a sight from Satoru Gojo, because he will always be the best. Bro is just built different among heaven and earth. He alone is the autistic one. So how is Jujutsu Kaisen able to balance that incredible level of power without completely breaking the plot? Well, for starters, he's not supposed to be the main focus. That's an issue we'll get into a little later. So the show can afford to just put him on the back burner while his many adopted children can deal with the actual plot. But something that's really neat about his characterization is that Gojo is a constant. His power, his presence, and his influence over the Jujutsu world are all a constant. And it provides this handy kind of safety net for the other characters. Oh, what's that? We just got trounced by this special grade curse? No worries, Gojo can handle it. Then what happens when that safety net gets taken away? The Shibuya incident arc. That's what. And shit hits the fan almost immediately. Sorcerers are jumped, people are killed, and cursed spirits that were previously hiding in fear of Gojo are now crawling out of the woodwork. And what's crazy about all this carnage is that it happens solely because one guy is taken out of commission. And in my opinion, that says way more than any narration, piece of dialogue, or even on-screen feat could say about Gojo's power that his mere presence 
or lack thereof could have such an impact on the wider Jujutsu world. But of course, JJK isn't the only anime with an OP character, far from it. And there's one series famous for its over-the-top powerful characters, including one guy in particular I'm sure anyone remotely interested in anime is familiar with. <laughs> Okay, so this one's a bit of a cheat, because Jojo has a lot, and I mean a lot, of overpowered characters. With abilities ranging from pretty simple concepts to what? Huh? What the fuck? What the fuck? But there's more to it than just the person's ability. There's how they use it, their relationship to their stand, and the character themselves. For those who only consume Jojo via the memes, Okuyasu is from part 4 of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and is the requisite bestie character. He's the main Jobro, the homie, in other words, he's my boy. And his stand the hand should be banned because it's so fucking broke. Can? But seriously, this thing can erase literally anything from existence. Objects? Gone. People? Gone. Divorce papers? Double gone. He can even erase the space in front of him, effectively teleporting himself. And if you ask me, it has the potential to be a super powerful stand. Like if, say, Dio or Diavalo had their hand on the hand, it would probably be quite scary and quite formidable. Well, the thing is, to be good at fights in JoJo, you need to strategize. Think ahead, play 4D chess with your opponent, and Okiyasu play shotgun roulette. I love this man, but he's literally just too stupid to use his own stand effectively. Which is low-key really good poetic irony, like he tries so hard to keep up with his opponents and his teammates, but is simply just unable to. Which I think is a really cool way to sort of justify what could possibly be like a really over-the-top powerful character, but kind of stealthily nerfing him. Now here's the bit that's going to anger some people. Jotaro? Part 3 Jotaro? Kind of poorly written. But in a weird way, he's kind of an inverse of Okuyasu, in the sense that the hand could be a super versatile stand if not for the user's own failings, while Jotaro both has arguably the best stand in Jojo and is incredibly competent himself. Which causes the obvious problems of no stakes when he's fighting, so off to the sidelines he goes. And in part 4, that's not really a problem. He's not the focus there, so it doesn't matter. But in part 3, he's the protagonist. He's the Jojo in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And in a show that hinges on throwing one fight after another at its characters, Constantly pulling the focus away from the supposed main character can get really frustrating. Especially because I actually really like Jotaro, and also they keep giving those stand battles to fucking Polnareff! Part 5 is my favourite part purely because of what they did to Polnareff. I'm stronger, I'm smarter, I'm better, I am better! Yeah, I couldn't think of a good segue, fuck you. Now. I'm not the biggest fan of Superman, but in a conversation about overpowered characters, I think he's worth mentioning since he's kind of one of the first. And funnily enough, a common criticism levied against him is the same shit I was ragging on Jotaro for. That he's too powerful and that no meaningful stakes can be created when he can just oh or in this case super the problem away? I don't fucking know. But whereas Jotaro's strength is sort of what defines him as a character, that and his misogyny, Superman is super second and man first. Who wrote this? It's great, right? Before finding out he was Kal-El of Krypton, he was Clark Kent from Smallville, Kansas. And above all else, he's hopeful. And I mean that literally, he's full of hope. And ultimately, that's what he uses his powers for, to instill that hope in others. Which is a big reason why he's persisted for so long. But a character that's enjoyed popularity since the 30s is inevitably going to be subject to writers wanting to either 
analyse or put their own twist on the character. Some tried to elaborate on his power set, while others tried to explore his morality and ideology on a more in-depth scale, both to varying degrees of success in my opinion. Where did he go? Where did he freaking go? Orbit. But that's something I think is really neat about Superman, is that aside from the core facts of Krypton, Kal-El, uh, Fortress of Solitude, Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, Daily Planet, yada yada yada, he's largely a very malleable character. And to that extent, I'd say that he, more than any other character I've talked about, has had this unique chance to um, kind of test out the different ways that uh, you can handle an overpowered character in media via those different reimaginings and incarnations of the character. At the end of the day, there's no right or wrong way to interpret him or his powers. And of course, people have tried to make their own Superman type characters, such as Marvel's Sentinel images. That one's a 2 for 1 special. Uh, what else? Oh, there's Brightburn. And then there's What If Superman Used 4chan? Now, I am a big fan of The Boys, but even I can admit Homelander hasn't got the most depth to him. But there's something that's really cool to me, and that's how a lot of the time it's not the power itself that intimidates, but rather the threat of that power and the image that he's built up as Vault's number one poster child. Oh my god, it's full circle, woo! So what am I trying to say with all this rambling? Well, the thing about all these characters and overpowered characters in general is that they can run the risk of completely derailing the plot and world of the show slash manga slash movie slash comic slash light novel slash video game slash whatever the fuck they're from. And sometimes they do, which can lead to a break in immersion and a sense of inconsistency. So to avoid that, writers have to think on their feet a bit. They have to get creative and come up with ways that they can justify or circumvent this immense difference in strength. I want to thank you guys for watching, but before I end the video, I just want to do some quick honourable mentions, starting with Goku from Dragon Ball. The only Dragon Ball thing I've ever seriously watched was Dragon Ball Z Abridged, so had I put him in the video, I would have been 90% talking out my ass. But I couldn't do an OP characters video without at least mentioning him once. I mean, come on. I would also like to shout out Freerin from Freerin, colon, Beyond Journey's End. I might do a video on this when the series wraps up, but something I love is that while Freerin can and does absolutely style on anyone she fights, it doesn't hinder the show that badly because unlike a lot of anime, Freerin's focus isn't on the fights, it's on the quieter and chiller moments. So it doesn't really matter if the battles don't really have stakes because they're not really supposed to, like they're not the focus. Okay for real this time, thank you again for watching, uh, if you're not already please consider subscribing or even just liking the video and I'll see you when I see you.